Kaya, Nan Kuel, Simon Forrest Purungu. Hello, my name is Simon Forrest, and I'm a Wajak Nunga man. And I'm here today to perform a welcome to country. In the days before the Swan River colony, Nungas would get permission to cross another person's territory. These days, elders from particular places do welcomes to country, to welcome strangers or visitors to this particular place. My welcome involves a smoking ceremony, and a smoking is about a cleansing, purification of the place and people. The smoking involves two elements, the waran or sandalwood from my father's country to the north, and the bienri or the gum resin from the balga or grass tree. This is my mother's country, my mother's maternal country. This place is a Nunga place. Nija Karagorap. Nija Maragorap. Nija Doebolerigan. Nija Bolo. May the ma or wind spread this kur or smoke to bring the dindin or good spirits to this place. Kayawandu Wajak Nungabuja. You can find accommodation over the internet, but never pay any money or sign a contract until you've seen the place in person. Never reveal your banking or financial details to a landlord online. Never ask your friends to choose accommodation or sign contracts on your behalf. When you do find a room, specific laws cover accommodation in Western Australia. Housing services can advise you on contracts and documents. Hi there, welcome to our latest episode of Inside Curtain. I'm Ariel Tresham. In this episode, we attend Curtain's official signing ceremony as we become a member of the prestigious edX group. We celebrate our Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander culture and students at the Yokai Festival. Discover a fantastic program that helps our students earn money while they study. And delve into the exciting world of multimodal research. In the short time that I've been at uni, I've already seen so much changing around me. One of those areas is with the growth of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. As confirmation of Curtin's achievements in this area, we've just been accepted alongside Harvard and MIT to the prestigious edX consortium. Today we recognise and celebrate Curtin joining one of the world's leading education platforms, the edX consortium. edX is a non-profit learning organisation founded by MIT and Harvard and it's a consortium of the world's leading universities and so it's an amazing opportunity for both edX and its consortium and Curtin to have you come on board. It's a very significant achievement for Curtin to join the edX consortium. edX is a major worldwide platform and to be able to take our teaching and learning onto the edX platform so that we take our teaching and learning to the world is really, really exciting. I think it's a wonderful reflection on our strengths as an institution, our, our innovative teaching and learning and uh, the fact that I think the consortium realised that uh, we had much to offer but we have a huge amount to gain through the partnership. Well seeing some of the innovation that's here on campus in teaching and learning, bringing some of that innovation forward to the online world of teaching, bringing gamification to its MOOCs, offering credit and potentially degree programs in an open way to students is a huge opportunity for learners around the globe and a place that I think that uh, Curtin can help lead within the edX membership. We're both very innovative organisations wanting to really change the world and change teaching and learning, bring education to the world. Welcome to the business of mining. 
Since 2008, 12 million students have done massive open online courses. Now, the business of mining is absolutely goes to our areas of comparative advantage, both as an institution with the very highly regarded WA School of Mines and indeed to the state of Western Australia and Australia. Thinking of our global learner base, there's so many parts of the country where mining is a major industry and to bring some of Curtin's expertise uh, to those folks all around the world is a big opportunity. It's a really exciting MOOC um, in terms of the way it's been developed and to be able to take that learning now from Curtin to the world is uh, really exciting. Such a great achievement for us and the start of even bigger things in the future. With around 400 Indigenous students at Curtin, we have one of the largest populations in the country. And to celebrate this culture, the first Yokai Festival was recently held in the uni grounds. Yokai is about celebrating um, uh, Aboriginal students that are on campus. And Yokai is um, a Noongar word for a shout in victory or gathering. So the whole reason why we've created this event is to make um, Indigenous students around Curtin University um, more aware and more interactive with the services and programs that they ha uh, Curtin has to offer, like the Student Support Centre, the Learning Centre and the Careers Centre. There's bands of music as you can hear, Aboriginal bands from various places um, throughout Western Australia. Show me my dream time won't you take me away? I think they got some kangaroo and damper on the go there. I haven't had any yet, but I noticed there's a, a fairly big lion ready to get a feed. Hey, it was delicious. I nearly licked my bowl, Kelly. <laughs> That's awesome. This is something like a real Australian. It was very delicious. I'm, the, I'm vegetarian, so I don't eat meat. <laughs> I was very ecstatic when they told me that we were going to have kangaroo stew. It's just like, yeah, can't do kangaroo sausages, the kangaroo thing, but add the stew proper. Have you ever tried kangaroo before? Uh, once, but it wasn't a pleasant experience, but this one is like really good. I've eaten roux before, but it was really good, yeah. It has a lot of flavour. I've had kangaroo before quite a few times, so it is. It's very nice. Because of the juice and of the herbs that are inside the, the juice. Does it taste like beef? No, it tastes like kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> it's kangaroo stew. <laughs> The university's had a long history in um, providing educational opportunities for Aboriginal people and this really is an event to celebrate that. My peers and friends have rocked up today and you know a lot of people in high positions as well like I'm so glad that Jill came down. It's fantastic to see you all here. So Yoko we're trying to as an initial event for the gathering of Aboriginal students hope to uh, replicate it on a yearly basis. What a great day. Awesome music, beautiful sunshine and a yummy meal. Perfect. For many students, trying to make financial ends meet while studying can prove to be a challenge. And often, part-time jobs don't go hand in hand with uni commitments, which is where Earn While You Learn comes to the rescue. Earn While You Learn is a curtain run program that facilitates the employment of students into on-campus roles. They can be part-time or casual. It's mostly focused on equity target groups, so students that wouldn't ordinarily maybe be able to afford to come to university. But if they've got a part-time job on campus, it means that it fits around their studies plus they're earning an income. I've used the service three times now. Um, and we've been able to get three wonderful students that have been able to help us out. Uh, one of the students, um, she started working with us for the first six months and then I have taken her on full time now. I was a student here at Curtin, I was studying externally and I saw the email come through from um, Earn While You Learn about a position with a National Research Centre and I looked at the um, job description and I thought, oh, I could probably do about 80% of that. So I just thought I'd be a little bit cheeky and throw my hat in the ring and before I knew it, here I was. The process is uh, very professionally run within Curtin and it's uh, much shorter than going out to um, have to uh, apply for someone to come in from the outside. It's actually easier to, to call me, to, you know, to, to ring on while you learn and say, quick, I need, I need someone to help out, you know, on reception or 
you know, moving some boxes or as a research assistant and, and they can make a quick phone call and generally within a day I can, I can get them you know, a short list of five students that will be able to do that role and they can you know, hire whoever they want. These students are fantastic, they're very motivated students. Uh, they take on quite a difficult role because we have students coming with all sorts of study skills issues but we found with very little training they adapt really well uh, they have a good good skill set already, so they're just a fantastic group to work with. Well, I got involved in Earn While You Learn when a lecturer actually told us about the Career Centre. And I came up to speak to them about how to get a job um, on campus because it was something that I was interested in. And they gave me um, a registration form with the initiative on it. So from there, I was just able to submit my resume where I got put in a pool with other participants and luckily enough, I got the call to come and work in the Career Centre. It's really easy. Um, you just need to get onto the Curtin website, search Earn While You Learn and you can um, fill out the registration form. You actually get your resume reviewed as part of the process so we give you some tips on how to make your resume better and then it's really easy. Once you're signed up we let you know about jobs that are coming up on campus and you can apply for them. We will often recommend certain roles to students if we think that they're going to be appropriate and yeah it's as easy as that. I would say go for it. Grab the opportunity with both hands because you never know what you're going to be asked to do, who you're going to meet, the doors that will open. Um, it's just been such a wonderful experience for me and I really, really love my job. I would definitely recommend it. It's so convenient to be able to work on the campus where you study as well. Um, the staff are so supportive, they allow me to choose my own hours and they always check in and encourage me to say something if I feel as though my workload is being too much. Well students really love it, they, um, you know, they get so much out of it, it does fit around their studies and they really love contributing to, to Curtin. Such a great initiative with big plans for the future. Speaking of the future, there's plenty of amazing research taking place at Curtin that is paving the way for future discoveries and innovations. One area is in the field of multimodal research. Multimodal analysis is looking at the relations across different resources that we use to communicate. For example, we use language um, and we also use images, increasingly more in the digital age. And so how do they interact to create meaning? Because if you're looking at a website, you can't just analyse the linguistic text, you also need to analyse and understand the image because they make meaning together. And of course in videos you've got a whole range of resources that are inter integrating. So multimodal analysis is concerned with human communication and all the different resources that go into it. Well the student experience today is multimodal. They're online. Um, they're using social media. It is a multimodal world, largely because of digital technology. And so the university is having a huge transition from traditional modes of teaching and learning into this new environment, which the students are quite familiar with. And so the university has to move itself forward to engage at, at the level, you know, of which the students would expect through other sorts of avenues, which are often commercial and well-produced productions. It's also for lecturers to understand, you know, that when they stand up and present, how effective their lecture is. I mean, you can have a, you can have a lecture with the students. That doesn't translate, you know, to a video when you put it online. And so what can we do to improve that online presence, you know, um, yeah, for the students and also for the lecturers to get their content more effectively across. It's a big shift for the university. Um, the traditional modes are no longer in, in fashion. I mean, they're no longer enough. I wonder if Kay and her team will be analysing and researching inside Curtin. Remember, we made you look good, so be nice, okay? That's all we've got time for today. If you'd like any more information on anything you've seen, then why not visit the Learning for Tomorrow website at curtin.edu.au. Thanks for watching and we'll catch you next time. If you hear someone mention parked, they're referring to the on-campus food vans and entertainment. EUC means unit controller. They're the main go-to person at campus. There's Oasis and Blackboard, which are the online portals for student learning. CV, it stands for Curtin Volunteers. 
An ally is someone who supports gay, lesbian, bisexual, intersex and transgender rights on campus. Shock therapy is useful in calming disturbed patients. So are sedative packs. The history of mental illness and its treatment in Western Australia dates back to 1865 when the Fremantle Lunatic Asylum was opened. I'm standing at Heathcote Point, and the history of this site dates back to 1827 when Captain James Stirling led an exploration of the Swan River. The first man to set foot on the south side of the river was midshipman Heathcote, and so this place got its name. Today, it's the remains of a mental institution. Patients at Heathcote came from all walks of life, and often included teenagers as inmates. People from other hospitals were also admitted here, and often these people were terminal cases, so the atmosphere at Heathcote could have been pretty intense at times. I'd, I'd stared at the building and had seen it as a, an imposing building, but it, it, that, it, it, it was just a complete shock to, to see it from the inside. Ironically, now a toy library and playgroup headquarters Swan House used to be the locked facility at the Point Heathcote Mental Institution. It was where people could be detained for up to six months and also where electric shock therapy was administered to people suffering from depression. They would be strapped down to a bed, shackled to a bed. Their feet and their arms were uh, tied and uh, there was probably a doctor and a nurse in the room with the patient delivering the uh, shock therapy and it didn't last for very long at all but the patient um, you could see them trem trembling on the on the bed as they were receiving that uh, shock therapy and then afterwards they were taken to another section of the ward and they just slept and slept and slept. This was designed to remove depression from the brain but frequently it left people totally debilitated, not even able to tie up their shoelaces. In here also was solitary confinement. This was the place that people were sent as a punishment. For instance, somebody who was anorexic who lost weight rather than gained it, was put into solitary confinement. And in solitary confinement, they simply had a bed. There was one window high up. There was no reading material, nothing to stimulate them at all. I did see some patients uh, in a padded cell that were in straight jackets. Uh, and it was cruel and it must have been my first or second day there and I was completely terrified and bewildered by the whole situation. I'd never seen anything quite like it. I, I, when I had a, a breakdown, I went to Charlie Gardner first and I was put into Heathcote after about a month. So I was hospitalised first and then went to Heathcote. It was scary. Um, I mean, you know, you, he couldn't put his shoes on, he couldn't do anything. And it was it's sort of like 24-7 care. And it was scary to know if he was ever going to come back <laughs> to being Keith. It was terrifying, yeah. 
There's no out. You go in and you stay there. You, you go locked in and, you know, with the nurses in the glass cabinets watching you. And I used to go in all day and come home after tea time. But no, you don't, there's no out. If you're in the major locked wards, um, it's 20 beds alongside, um, in rows in a big dorm, and you have a cabinet for your personal items, you know, one drawer, one cupboard, and then you have nursing staff monitor sitting in the corners, and there's no, there's no out. By the 1950s, Heathcote was always full. It took 45 male patients, 45 female, and there were 22 in the locked ward in Swan House. Short staffing made it very difficult. There were three staff on each ward during the day and the afternoon, and only two each night. And many of those staff had no medical training whatsoever. Even up into the late 20th century, the fear and misunderstanding of mental illness was great among the public and the worry and concern about going into a place like Heathcote was terrifying and if you had to resort to being admitted to a mental hospital then the stigma attached to that was enormous. Well, this is perhaps the thing that I remember most um, is the tower. It, it, I mean looking at it now it looks um, rather terrific uh, but for me it was actually a kind of looming presence um, because there were gates there I think I only came here the once uh, my mother was here I don't know how many times um, at least six and probably more um, because when we were very young uh, what I it was only years later that I discovered that it wasn't just uh, postnatal depression that my mother was suffering from uh, it was uh, issues in her life going right back to her when she was a young girl of uh, 18 especially. Um, uh, so clearly I think she probably had um, uh, prenatal depression, uh, postnatal depression, sorry, um, uh, with each child, three, three children. The reason Point Heathcote was chosen as the location for a place to bring the mentally ill for healing was quite simply that up on this promontory it had magnificent views, it was surrounded by beautiful woodland and plants. This was all felt to be part of the healing process. But it didn't help the neighbours next door who felt very threatened by the thought of having a mental institution next to their property. And indeed, right up to the 1970s, when there were stories of people escaping from the locked section of this building and climbing the wireless tower on Wireless Hill that fueled people's fears about having the mentally ill close to them. Perhaps the worst part for me is the notion of experimenting with people. Um, um, a practice that now doesn't occur uh, a leucotomy, the extreme form is a lobotomy. Um, my mother had that and I remember as an 11 year old feeling deeply, deeply anxious that they were going to do something to her. Um, for me, it was a kind of prison and one that I didn't have access to um, and that other people had control of my mother, but that would be normal for any kid when mum disappears periodically. Uh, so the building, when you think about it, it's like something out of a film. Um, here's this big tower on a headland, um, which you go past and you can't get in because there are gates. So, I mean, <laughs> you'd like it to be a bit more anonymous because uh, um, the notion that up on the hill is a mad person. <laughs> the staff, doctors and patients, without exception, the kindness itself. So the people there have every chance of returning to normal good health.
When we came into government in 1993, I considered that this site and the one opposite, that is the sunset site in Dalkeith, were the two most outstanding sites uh, on the Swan River. Look, I just love this place. I mean, you just look across at the most beautiful vista of the river, uh, up and down the river, across to Kings Park and through to the city. I do believe it is important that we understand what it was used for, we understand the heritage of the site, and it's wonderful to see uh, you know, not only the public access today, but people who previously were involved here being able to come here and walk through and, and, and see what it is now being utilised for. The hospital finally closed in 1996, and it was West Australian Premier Richard Court who made the decision to have these buildings converted into something with a community use. So today we have a museum, a cafe, a playgroup, and many other activities taking place here, including this magnificent play area. So somewhere that once held fear for the entire community is now a place of joy and healing. A little bit of heaven fell out of the sky one day and it landed on a hilltop right here in WA. There are some who don't know it, it's sort of hidden but not remote, while referring to the haven, the wonderful Heathcote. Oasis and Blackboard aren't the same thing. Oasis is for official communications, student emails and campus information. Blackboard is the online learning space which has information about your assignments, the grades for your assignments, your course outline, your discussion board and also teacher feedback. Enrolling is taking the class as part of your course, whereas registering is choosing the date and time you'd like for your class. You get to create a timetable that suits your lifestyle. Download the Blackboard app to your smartphone to get the latest announcements and grade marks wherever you are. If you take public transport, you can save loads of money by linking a smart rider via Oasis to get student fares on buses, trains and ferries. You can print your documents to any printer on campus from your own computer by going on Oasis and clicking print online. It's really convenient. You need your student ID for lots of things on campus. You can fast track that process by uploading a photo to Oasis and showing that it fits the guidelines and then collecting it from Student Central when it's ready.
Jamie, I guess if you've got a spot to kind of hide pipes behind the wall or something, and just sit there like a student until it's ready to go. If you're hiding on the ramp, um, then you can actually see everything and then come along from there. Yep. And Wapol's going to be behind that building there. Curtin Stadium is home to everything fun and sporty here on campus. Uh, the gym's awesome. Got access to all the latest equipment here, access to personal trainers as well, group fitness classes, boot camp, spin, it's great. Each season there are around 300 teams playing nine different social sports and it's a great way to meet new people. The programs here are awesome. You can sign up to do anything from stand-up paddle boarding to African drumming. You can find the latest news and offers on the Curtin Stadium website. Just like Facebook took the online world by storm, connecting people and information, our own digital platform is taking steps to connect students in a simple, useful way. The mobile study assistant that we're building is an app for Curtin University students. It's about providing uh, a streamlined way of delivering all the relevant information that the students need. So they've got everything they need at their fingertips. So uh, assisting them while they're on campus or, or before they're coming in and just uh, letting them know, you know what they've got coming up for their day so they can plan things, see where lessons are, um, notes, things that, that are associated with their study and really just make it easier to, to get around and, and I guess navigate. It's about their timetable, it's about communication mechanisms, it's about uh, unit information, so all their unit outline information, really everything summarised in a convenient way. Uh, in a convenient access method through their mobile phones. It's where students are, you know, the, the, the devices are a really key part of their daily lives and so we want to be able to provide them with something that you know, is really useful to them in that space. When I wake up in the morning I reach for my mobile phone, I check my email, I check Facebook, so we envisage the students might check their email, check Facebook and check their curtain app and then they might have three notifications, one's an OCC, one's an announcement from their lecturer and one's about an upcoming event at university. So that's the type of use case that we're envisaging, as well as just general access to all the information they need. It's a smart assistant. It pulls information from a number of back-end curtain systems and summarises it in a nice way for the students. Currently it's in development, so we're looking at uh, yeah, a smaller release mid-year and a wider release to students in second semester. Keep a lookout for the first release later this year. You could join a social sports tournament. You can do either netball, volleyball or indoor soccer. The circus club, they roam around campus and they do some pretty cool tricks. The Curtin Wall Street Club, it's building better graduates and we do that through our events and publications and all the stuff we offer free to students. I was part of the Curtin Engineering Club, even though I wasn't an engineering student. They have the beers on the lawn uh, every two weeks or so and they have a great ball every year as well. The Cosplay Club, they look like they're a lot of fun walking around campus dressed up. Yeah, I'd join that one. 